We must try to learn what it is these horrors want. This is the No Fear Podcast. We know what scares you. I'm Matt. I'm Mel. And I'm Lisa. And this is the No Fear Cast, the podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is episode 11 of season 5, and we're following up our watch through of The Haunting of Bly Manor by watching another Henry James adaptation, The Innocence. So, um, yeah, as I said in the intro, we're focusing this episode on the, uh, the movie The Innocence, which I know... I know Mel has seen before, and Lisa, I'm pretty sure you've seen before as well. Um, I also <laughs> have seen this several times. So for I I'm fairly, feel fairly confident that this is not any of our first time watching it, but it's always a good good movie to watch through. And it's uh, for those of you that may not be super aware of it, if you haven't heard of it, it's a adaptation of Turn of the Screw. It's a lot, I guess, a lot closer in the than Bly Manor was in some regards, since Bly Manor was also bringing in uh, several other James stories. But uh, it's, uh, well, it's, it's a great movie. <laughs> and uh, uh, for those of you who are uh, Truman Capote fans, he wrote the screenplay for it. And, you know, he wrote In Cold Blood and also Breakfast at Tiffany's. So, well, I mean, I guess I'm actually turn it over to you, Mel, it, it, put you on the spot a little bit because i know that you have actually used this movie in classes that you've taught about uh ghosts and haunting and spectrality so i kind of want to feel like it'd be good to start by uh kind of getting your your input on the movie uh sure yeah i'd be happy to jump in yeah this is a movie i've seen several times i feel i feel like i may have first watched it just because i was looking at movies that related to turn of the screw because of teaching if not it would not have been that far ahead of teaching about it and i know lisa's used it because lisa gave me some tips when i was teaching turn of the screw about using different movie adaptations so i appreciated that I really enjoy The Innocence. I have to say of the two adaptations of Turn the Screw I've used in the classroom, the students seem to be more, um, I don't know what the word would be, but it, the it, the uh, the uh, BBC like masterpiece version with Jody May and I think Colin Firth seem to be like more approachable <laughs> for the students that say the innocence, but I have had students enjoy it. And I particularly like looking at the end of the innocence. Well, and the end of the masterpiece movie too. I won't spoil the end of the masterpiece version in case people haven't seen it, but they handle, both of them handle the end of the book in different ways. And <clears throat> I have to say watching the innocence this time, I, it's been a few years since I watched The Innocence last, and the end really struck me, like the way they took James's words, but used the framing of the scene and the way the characters were looking at each other, talking to each other to really, I don't know, I feel like maybe my interpretation of what's going on maybe changed slightly, like every time I see this movie too, because there's just so much, They, I think there is one way to look at it, but I think even even if you go with that one way, which is that the governess has issues, there's still enough evidence in the movie that something something weird is going on. Um, whether it's actually supernatural or just the kids are traumatized, I think are the two different questions. But uh, I like I like the way it's done. I like the kind of quiet creepiness of it, and I guess the uh, frightening aspects there's not really jump scares it's just more like quiet creepiness but there's a darkness to how the ghosts kind of like loom around instead of like jumping out at you and I feel like the kids do a really good job of seeming creepy also I think I texted you Lisa but I had not realized how much Bly Manor pulled from this movie from dialogue to things that happen and scenes I mean, Bly Manor is really kind of a, a love letter in some ways, I think, to The Innocents, which I thought was really interesting. And so I'm glad that we did this watch after watching Bly Manor. Um, I just want to throw out there, I know, Matt, you talked about Truman Capote writing the script. This was also adapted 
from a play, The Innocence, that had come out in the early 50s by William Archibald. So parts of it were adapted from that play. So he got a writer's credit. But Clayton said that Capote pretty much wrote about 90% of the script. And Jack Clayton was the director, the producer. He went on, of course, to direct The Great Gatsby. And I didn't know this until looking him up, but he also directed Something Wicked This Way Comes, which is a movie we talked about early in the podcast during one of our summers when we were talking about different movies. And I won't talk about the scary things or when Something Wicked This Way Comes, but I could totally see looking back on it how Clayton maybe put his stamp on it. I read an article that he wanted to focus a little bit more on the father than maybe the Disney wanted to do, than the, than the children. I could totally see that. Also has Deborah Kerr in it, um, playing the young governess. Even though at the time she was 40, Clayton felt like she was the best actress, though. And she does lend a kind of stability, I guess, to the character that, in a weird way that maybe makes her falling apart more like believable. And then you have Michael Redgrave very shortly as the uncle. And you have Megs Jenkins as the housekeeper who was in a bunch of movies around that time. And then, of course, you have, uh, was it Michael Stevens, I believe? Martin um, Stevens. Martin Stevens played Miles. And Pamela Franklin played Flora. And Pamela Franklin was also in The Legend of Hell House and in The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. I think she was in a couple other horror movies, but they're not right on the tip of my tongue. So was well, so Martin yeah. Stevens. He was. Too. What movie was he in? Village of the Damned. Ah, duh. I saw it like like a year ago. He he has like the, the corner, you know, uh, the market cornered on creepy kids, at least during that time period, I think. Oh, he's terrible in Village of the Damned. Yeah, he he has. He's he's a terrible, he's a mean character, not a terrible actor. Sorry. I'm sorry, Martin. But uh, yeah, he's a creepy kid, whatever he was in, I guess. So cool. Lisa, I'll just throw it to you then. Like, I know you used to use it in the classroom. What What are your thoughts this time around? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, we, we must have had these conversations a lot. I know we did. It has just been so many years since I've, I, I've taught this text and these movies in class. Like, I used to do it a lot during my summer courses because we didn't have much time they were always abbreviated (laughs) courses like semesters we were trying we were trying to cram like a whole semester into maybe four weeks and so I was limited with what I would what I would do and usually if I was teaching a course like this I would do the turn of the screw I would have them read it because it's a novella so you can read it relatively quickly and then we would watch The Innocents and we would follow it up with that 1999 masterpiece theater version. And it's, it is so hard for me to pick a favorite between the two. Like you, I I won't talk about the ending right now because, oh man, they are vastly different. (laughs) But I, I will say, I don't know. I feel like the masterpiece theater one gives a, a, a little more, I don't know what the right word is, a little more care given to the governess's character there's just more explored there i'm really curious about deborah kerr i did not realize she was 40 years old when she was playing this and i wondered it when i was re-watching it because i thought you know she doesn't look young but then i thought well maybe i'm comparing it too much to because we had just finished bly manor and it's hard not to kind of make that comparison between her and victoria uh padretti the the actress who played danny but she, there, there was a way that she portrayed Miss Giddens in this, in this adaptation that I found really intriguing because the way she would talk about her past, and I mean, a lot of this was, I, I'm guessing, Capote's dialogue too, but just the, the way she would deliver her lines as well, when she would talk about how for instance, that this was her first job, and but she loved children so much, and that was that was the only thing she wanted to do was to care for children and give them love. I don't know that there was not a sinister <laughs> nature behind it, but just a weirdness. That's the word I'll go with. Even in the way she would talk about her father, you know, that at one point when she's talking talking to Miles uh, towards the end, she says something along the lines that, you know, father taught me to help people, even when they don't want your help, he taught me to help them. And he taught me to help them even when it hurts them. 
And, you know, of course, this is foreshadowing what's about to come, which um, we'll get to the end and really kind of talk about that. But like with the way she delivered those lines, it it made me wonder really what had gone on in her past. Because just just the way she would talk about things and, and the fact that this was her first governess job and she did look older, I think played to that advantage too. Because I don't know, she walked in to the to the movie, I think, with me questioning whether or not everything was all right with her. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, I totally get that. I think, I don't know if uncanny is the right word or not, but I found myself constantly going back and forth between, you know, she looks like she's older. I looked up her age because I just wanted to know. And then also she's so, there's a naivete to her. Yes. Like there was like a 20 year old's naivete in an older person and I agree like I don't know that I was thinking about her past as much as as you were but that quote where she's like you know my father taught me to help people even when it hurts I cringed I was like whoa that's no 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 and I feel like she's more unreliable than the governess in the book because there are there's like at least one glaring Okay, so the governess in the book, I'm not going to go into this too much because we're focused on the movie, but the governess in the book does not see, one of the things that makes you think maybe she's seen ghosts is she doesn't see anything about Quint until she sees him. And she describes what she sees, and by that, they figure out she's talking about Quint. In this movie, she's already seen Quint, and she sees him through the window right after that. And so... I was kind of like, yeah, I don't know. But there was, what, twice where she says that things happen that didn't happen. Whereas in the book, the only time the governess lies, I think, if I remember correctly, is when she says that she and Jessel talk to each other in the schoolroom. But in this movie, she tells Mrs. Gross something different that happened at the lake. She tells her that she she knows Flora saw Mrs. Jessel, uh, which it kind of seemed like she did to me too, but I'm not going to say that they like talk to each other or whatever it was. But then she also talks about how she talked to her in the schoolroom and she imputes all this stuff. to. It's not just like in the book where the governess says, I talked to Miss Jessel and she told me she's in hell and she wants to possess Flora. In this one, she says she talked to Miss Jessel and Miss Jessel told her, what is it, that she is, oh, I wish I could find it. She is hungry for Quint. And then she continues on and says, she is hungry. She is hungry for his touch. She is hungry for his lips. She is like, and she like keeps going and Miss Gross like cuts her off. And I found that a little bit disturbing too, because like I, I felt like that was a big warning bell that something is going wrong here in a major way with this woman and kind of took my eye off the children in a way that I don't know that Henry James's novella did, if that makes sense. I felt like this governess was a little bit more unreliable and maybe it was partially that naivete in an older person, but her, I, I always felt like she was talking about herself when she was listing all the body parts Jessel was hungry for and not Jessel because Jessel didn't say do anything but cry. There was a tear on the blackboard, which was creepy. But why make up all that stuff? I felt like it went further with making her unreliable than James even did. Yeah, I I agree. Um, and I think that's why if, if I'm looking at the two different adaptations, now we should mention there have been other turn of the screw adaptations. I'm just most familiar with this one and the Masterpiece Theater one from 1999, I think. I haven't seen The Turning yet, which which was the one that came out in 2020 that I think is based on it. And then there was another one. Now you're going to have to help me remember the name because it's something strange. Oh, the um, prequel one? Nope. Yeah. About Quentin Jessel, The Nightcomers. Nightcomers, yeah. I haven't seen that one either, but I've read some terrible things <laughs> <laughs> about it. Yeah, I feel like if if you're looking for uh, a character, yeah, that's why I think in the Masterpiece Theater version, she's treated with a little bit more care. I think it might be a little bit closer to what you get in James's story. Like it, it, it's maybe a more faithful adaptation. Because one thing that Blind Manor didn't do, and I'm sure we'll talk pretty soon about um, 
everything Bly Manor took from this movie because I was like you. I was astounded when I watched it again. <laughs> Because I was so busy looking for James references that I wasn't even thinking about the this movie version. But one of the big differences is that in the in the original James story, the uh, governess is really quite taken with the uncle. You know, she's even though the uncle wants nothing to do with anything that's happening at Bly and nothing to do with the children, she's you know intrigued with him. Maybe has a little like scroll school girl girl crush on him the it, it, there's an allusion to the fact that he likes to hire like pretty young women and that he's kind of a womanizer and he enjoys the single life like being a bachelor in london and so it, i think that goes with that naivete but the way deborah kerr would play it up when she would talk about the uncle or ask after him she'd get this like like her eyes would go wide and she'd kind of go glassy <laughs> when she was talking about him. And and it was just so eerie watching watching it happen because I think it, it lended to that fact that she is very unreliable and that, I mean, she really can't be trusted because she almost rem reminded me of somebody who'd been like locked away for most of her life and had no idea how the world worked. Yes. Um, yes. Very much. Yeah. So. It, it's that naivete that you were talking about, Mel. But but like, and, and when you contrasted it, because this was the other major difference too with the with the children who have no naivete about them, you know. And I mean, granted, they've been through trauma in all versions. You know, the the children have been traumatized. They've been, you know, they've lost their parents. They have an uncle who just pretty much has abandoned them. They were under the care of Peter Quint, who apparently was just terribly abusive. Um, and then they lost their governess who they loved, especially, you know, Flora was especially fond of her. So there's no doubt that they went through trauma. But in this one in particular, I think because in Blind Manor, we get all the backstory of Miles uh, and Flora and and we see them as children. You know, all the, the trauma and ghosts notwithstanding, we kind of, we get glimpses of who they are when they are not being controlled by the ghosts. But in this one, this version really plays up the creepy kid angle. <laughs> I think I, I texted you, Mel, when I was watching it because when they go to pick up Miles from the train station after he's been kicked out of school, and, you know, at this point, I felt bad for Miss Giddens because she had no idea what to do. She had just found out that she was in charge of these two children. She's apparently supposed to raise them and not ask any questions of the uncle. And when he gets kicked out of school, she has no idea how to deal with it. You know, she's like, what do I do? Do I call the school? Like, do I, you know, what do I do here? Do I write to the school? Do I keep him home? Do I enroll him in a new school? I mean, you can just imagine she had no clue how to handle the situation. And this was maybe her first week there, right? I mean, it, it it's mind blowing. But they're they're riding in their little horse and carriage, and she's asking him what happened. She's trying to like pry it out of him, and he's looking out the window, and. When she asks a question he doesn't want to answer, he just smiles and darts his eyes the other way and ignores her. And it was so unsettling. <laughs> I was just like, this is the creepiest thing I've ever seen. Flora even. You know, Miles in The Haunting of Bly Manor was terrifying when he was taken over by Quint. And usually you knew when he was taken over by Quint because he would say things um, that didn't sound like a little boy would say, or he would have different mannerisms, or he'd get that like hard look in his eyes. I mean, this Miles is, it, it, but Flora in, in Haunting of Bly Manor was, I mean, she was pretty angelic. She was, she was um, perfectly splendid <laughs> through the whole show. I mean, she was, she was wonderful. And you felt for the children, you wanted them to be safe. This Flora, however, is like cute and precocious in an absolutely 
bad seed kind of way. She is, I mean, at one point she tries to drown her tortoise. It, <laughs> she's terrifying. I mean, they really played that up to good effect. So I don't think you said we didn't have jump scares in this and we didn't need jump scares. Um, but the ghosts were terrifying. Um, but the children, the children were terrifying. And then Miss Giddens, I mean, I don't, I don't know what her story was, but she was, she was a whole new level of something. Everybody was terrified to a certain extent. I mean, when she shows up, the relief that Miss on Mrs. Gross's face is like, "Whoa, what's been going on here?" And then the whole like, uh, this was also a blind manner, but Flora talks about how every time the kids tell Mrs. Gross they hear weird noises or hear voices, she says "stuff and nonsense." And so Flora is just like dancing around, going "stuff and nonsense, stuff and nonsense." And the governess is like, "Well, you know, didn't you hear that or whatever?" And they're like, "Oh, there's really creepy noises all the time, and it's stuff." And nonsense and i'm just like okay so apparently so even if the governess is like has issues and a lot of this is her problem there is something like you said it really creepy about the kids they have been damaged in some way by the abuse and that they witness on quint's part toward jessel at them most likely but also it's like the governess is not some of the supernatural stuff that the governess is noticing is apparently stuff that has been mentioned and mrs gross just represses it um, which she says, you know, the governess's problem is that she's making the kids remember terrible things. And so she's just like, well, the kids just need to forget about this and, and move on with their lives. But I also agree that the kids were scary. The trying to drown the tortoise. When Flora's uh, so happy to see the spider eating the butterfly and is like petting them while it's going on. I thought that was disturbing. Their random bursts of laughter at the weirdest times was super creepy. I mean, just their cherubic faces were creepy to me. But yeah, they seemed perfect, but there was always something weird about them. Miles being entirely too friendly with her. What was it? Oh, when Miles is choking her after the weird pre-bedtime hide-and-seek that is also in Bly Manor. And she goes in the attic looking at the dolls and she finds the uh, music box and Miles sneaks up behind her and is like uh, choking her. That was creepy. And then that's also when the children overhear Mrs. Gross telling her about Quint and they just start laughing hysterically. Oh, the the recital of the poem about how my Lord is dead and he still comes to visit me that um, Miles gives, which is reminiscent of the, the recital that the kids give in Bly Manor. I mean, all this stuff is really creepy. That was funny, too, because this is this Giddens like jumps up and says, Mrs. Gross, was it that basically she's like, wasn't it like the creepiest thing you've ever seen? And Mrs. Gross, like, oh, whatever. It's a kid reciting a poem. And sometimes I wondered if the kids were doing this just to see how far they could go with Miss Giddens. But on the other hand, there's also this just really creepy implication that they spent too much time with Quentin Jessel. And they're doing these things that they maybe shouldn't be doing as kids. And that's why it seems so weird. I don't know, Lisa, Matt, do you guys think that they were pushing the limits? Like, let's read, let's chant this creepy poem and see what happens to Miss Giddens. <laughs> I absolutely think that if they weren't under the influence of ghosts, like, because that is one of the wonderful things we should say about these two adaptations. We've kind of been mentioning The Innocence and then the Masterpiece Theater, Turn of the Screw is the wonderful line they walk with ambiguity where you could read it as either there are ghosts or they these are just severely traumatized people and the children are yeah just what's the right word enacting everything that they've seen because that's what children do children you know pretend to be like the adults around them and in this case they just had terrible adults around them but i wrote down in the scene too you know, they, they did the idea of the play and Miles does this creepy poem. And one of the lines in there is when he says, welcome, my Lord. And this came right after a conversation Miss Gross had had with Miss Giddens, where she said that Miles basically worshipped Quint. And I thought that was a nice parallel because we had already heard like, well, yeah, young Miles just worshiped this horrible man. And then now he give, reads, says this creepy poem saying, welcome, my Lord. So it kind of lends to that. Like, is he showing that indeed he worships him and that he wants to be like him? 
and he's pushing now uh, on Miss Giddens because he thinks it's fun? Or is that like a, it's you, it's me, it's we kind of <laughs> line from Bly, you know, where he's actually welcoming his Lord in. It, I don't know. It's it's really interesting because the other one that really, the other scene that really, really bothered me was when Miss um, Giddens was putting Miles to bed after all this and he just lays a kiss on her that went on for just like two seconds too long <laughs> and even she seems really terrified by the whole thing and I, I don't know that was just so like creepy and icky and gross and it it was terrifying on multiple lev levels because you thought okay either he is under the effects of Quint the ghost, or he has seen Quint act that way around women. And now that's just how he thinks men act around women, which may be, that may be the case because later at their little tea party, he says, you know, he's enjoying playing the man of the house. And so maybe that's just what he thinks the man of the house does, but it's just so gross. Oh, it's absolutely gross <laughs> uh uncomfortably unsettlingly gross uh but I, i'm so glad that you mentioned the the ambiguity part of it because i feel like as much as i like haunting of bly manor the one thing that they didn't do enough of for me was playing to that ambiguity they they pretty quickly established oh no these are actual literal ghosts and that's that's fine that's their interpretation and i really enjoy their interpretation but one thing that i've always liked in stories in general is that kind of ambiguity where you're not quite sure i feel like that's really in a lot of places where real unsettling horror lies is in the places where we're not quite sure if what we're seeing is supernatural or like you said, kids reenacting uh, things that they had witnessed uh, at too young of an age or the trauma uh, and not quite knowing which one it is. I feel like for me, that's the, that that's really where horror gets real unsettling. And, and I like that. I mean, not not all the time because uh, I, I do like to feel comfortable, <laughs> but, uh, you know, when I'm watching horror, I guess I should say. Yeah, I feel like it's real. it would be really hard. I say I feel like I don't know. I've never done a movie before, but I feel like it's, it would be hard to take the ambiguity that you can get in a novel or novella or story and put it on the screen. But I think... Uh, well, I mean, both the masterpiece and this one do it so well, but I, I think Clayton did a really good job with it in this one too, because we are kind of, we're kind of like the governess in that we're just sucked into this isolated place as well, observing her. Like you said, Lisa, when she finds out that Miles has been expelled, you're like, well, what's she going to do with this? And I have to admit, she faces stuff head on in a way that the governess in the book doesn't do. I mean, the governess in the book waits until the very end of the book to even ask about the expulsion. And she, she goes in there and starts asking me when he won't answer. But I mean, I just feel like it would be kind of hard in a visual medium to keep you on that tension and the net unease that you were describing Matt. because I, I feel like there's maybe more you could do with words on a page and describe it. I might be wrong about that, but I think Clayton does a really good job. The visions and the dreams that the governess has shows you her state of mind. Every time you feel like you judge something, something kind of turns you in the opposite direction. I mean, even when the, the ghosts are around, the kids may say they don't see them, but there are moments where I find myself leaning toward Miss Giddens and thinking, yeah, maybe the kid has seen something. I mean, why, when he says, welcome, my Lord, and he's whispering, is he looking out the same window that Clint was looking in? There's just these moments that make you very uncertain. Though, this is kind of going back in our conversation. I was thinking, we get more about the Quint and Jessel relationship in this than we've ever gotten in a version. I mean, it's really intense, the stuff that Quint would do to Jessel. And the fact that Quint and Jessel basically let the kids watch them no matter what they were doing even in intimate situations but it's before the governess even knows that she says what the kids are involved in is quote monstrous secretive and indecent and i thought those are really strange 
terms to use for what she thought was going on when she doesn't even know the history of what Quentin Jessa were doing at that point. Like she just went zero to 60 way faster than I thought she should with her interpretations of what was going on. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, we do. And I think this probably, now that I'm thinking about it, because we do get so much more about um, Jessel and Quint's relationship in this one. I think that led to when I watched The Haunting of Bly Manor, I I just from the get go was insistent that Quint be a monster. Like I didn't want, I didn't want them to try to humanize Quint in any sort of way. And it's funny because now rewatching this, The Innocence, that I think is where I pulled a lot of that from that Quint is just nothing but a scary, abusive man. And, and that's part of it, it. I guess in the end, even though there is a lot of ambiguity about whether there are ghosts or whether like the governess is just seeing things and it, and it's part of her own psychology, and she's just like witnessing two children who have, who who have taken on too much trauma, um, that maybe she's not equipped to deal with. Either way, whether it's a ghost or it's just the trauma of what they went through, Peter Quint is still the cause of all of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he is still just an evil man. And it's funny that I think I brought that with me into the the viewing of Bly Manor. Yeah. I hadn't put that together before. I don't know. Should we talk about some of the things that Bly Manor stole from, not stole, <laughs> took from the innocence? Uh, I guess homage might be a better term. Uh, sure. Yeah. Do you want to throw something out there? Was there something you were thinking of? Oh, no, I was just, I, I was shocked that from the beginning, there was so much. I mean, obviously you have the, Oh, Willow Whaley song it, that is just as creepy in this version, if not more. <laughs> and there's, I think you had pointed out when we started watching it, that like the bird sounds and the birds flying overhead, there, there's a lot of shots of the sky and the birds um, singing that, that they pulled from that. But like little stuff I didn't even realize, like when Miss Giddens arrives, she's so taken by the beauty of Bly that she says, I think I'd like to walk from here. And she asks, to the guy to stop the guy driving her in to stop so that she can walk up. And that's how she meets the children is actually walking up that way. And that was something that I had completely forgotten about, but I I liked that, that quite a bit. There was also a lot of the imagery, like the white roses, stuff like that. I hadn't picked up on. Um, I had completely forgotten that there were, there was the dead white bird in the innocence. I mean, it's, it's been years since I've watched it. Um, well, and Miles, part of his being bad is he has a pigeon with a broken neck in his bed, which I was exactly. very disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. That's not normal. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I mean, they play up the, I mean, come on this first Flora tries to drown the tortoise and in that scene, I was just like, she's so, they're all so casual about it. You know, she's just like, Miss Giddens, can tortoises swim? <laughs> and Miss Giddens says, no, I don't think so. And she says, I didn't think so either. <laughs> it just pulls the tortoise out of the water. And I was just like, okay. She like dries it off in a dress. You know, just very, I was like, okay, you just tried to drown your animal. And then not, not many scenes after that, um, you had the dead pigeon and it is the same like white bird. And, and the implication there is at least this Giddens thinks Miles killed it because it looks like his neck has been broken. It wasn't just a natural death. And he says he's going to bury it the next day and everything. But that that was a wonderful. I really like the way Bly took that and used it to kind of humanize Miles and, and fill in what happened at school. But at the same time, it, in doing that, it kind of lost some of the creepy factor that this one had. Even Miss Jessel, you know, when she appeared as the ghost, she was dressed in all black. And seen crying outside, I mean, first in the school, school room, but then outside the lake. And that shot is almost identical where 
where Miss Jessel realizes that she's actually died and she is having her her breakdown moment, which I, I thought was really neat. And Quint too, like showing up in the window that I remembered that part um, where they're playing hide and seek and she sees the open window and and then sees Quint there. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm probably missing a lot. A lot of the lake shots were very similar. Yeah. Um, almost all of that. The the playing with the sound too, not just the tripping of the bird, but there was also the, um, when she would see the ghost, everything would get quiet. Like it'd be completely silent. And then there's almost this weird, like almost like slight buzzing sound when she sees them. And that was also in Bly Manor. Um, and a throwaway thing that I noticed is when Flora's giving her the tour at the beginning, she says big rooms get bigger at night, which was something that they played with in uh, the first episode of Bly when she has the insomnia. So yeah, I mean, there were just so many little callbacks to the innocent that I just, innocence I thought was really fascinating. Oh, and even Miles says at one point that they shouldn't trust Flora because she makes things up and she lies which I thought was interesting. I don't know why he told her that other than to just be creepy, but they played with that in Bly. Yeah, there's the music box and, and that the playing hide and seek in the attic. All that was taken. There, there was a there was a lot of uh I I, w- I would like to <laughs> I don't have time to, but I would like to watch it all again <laughs> and just see what else I can pick up because you can tell that there's a real love for this movie which I appreciate I appreciate it a lot one thing I do wish after watching this and and I had forgotten it was in the innocence until I started watching it again and then I remembered I loved it a lot that I wish they had kept in the haunting of Bly Manor was the statue garden that that I don't know I just I always liked the idea of it, it was so creepy to me and I guess he kind of plays with it with the idea of like the dolls that are all over the place, you know, placed randomly in Bly. But in the innocence, you see, you first see it from a window where she's looking out and and it's just so eerie because it's like the statue garden and all the statues are like in a circle and kind of facing inward towards each other. And then there's, I think like a a little statue or a fountain or something in the middle. I can't remember now. But of course, the end scene takes place there, and there's the there's the great like there's the great shot where the camera is just kind of and he, and he does this several times where the camera just kind of spins in the movie and and really makes it feel disorienting. But I always loved that because that. I don't know. Like you said, there weren't a whole lot of jump scares, but that to me is always a really scary scene is just all the statues because they feel so imposing and the way the the camera is like at a lower angle and looking up and they just look like they're towering over you. And it's a very claustrophobic feeling and it's a very disorienting feeling. It's a very scary feeling. And of course it like lends to the panic that that scene culminates in yeah i had forgotten how desperately terrified miles is like that moment when it's toward the end and she just keeps chasing him and chasing him and he's trying to climb over the hedge to get away from her and he falls like at that point i was like wow he could be possessed or he could be a terrible child but he is terrified of this woman like he is scared to death of her and i didn't remember that I did not remember that particular like fear of her even when um he thinks there's a ghost there and he still can't see him he never does see Peter Quint um that moment where he says Peter Quint uh where you devil where and a lot of people interpret that as he's calling Peter Quint the devil he turns and he looks at the governess he's like Peter Quint and then he turns looks at the governess you dev where you devil where he's calling her the devil so you get this idea that the kids have been terrified of this woman, you know, this whole time. I mean, if you look at it that way, then she's just been misinterpreting their behavior. And maybe we have been too. And uh, she's putting him through all this for no reason. Though I have to admit, he does do the tortoise in finally, because he throws him through the greenhouse window as hard as he can. And he does scream a lot of horrible things at her, he uses very nasty language for his age. So maybe he was possessed. I don't, again, am, ambiguous, but he is terrified of that woman at the end when he's running and falling. 
Well, yeah, and you you've got to wonder because she starts in on him. I mean, if you look at it from his point of view, something had happened at school. He's very vague about it. You know, he says he spoke words he shouldn't have, I think is what he ends up saying, something along those lines. And that he's just, but his main thing is I'm just different. And, you know, I'm not like the other kids. And you, for me, I felt for him in that moment because I thought, well, of course you're not like other kids. Like you've had to grow up so fast. You're, you've been through a whole lot of trauma that probably kids your age don't understand. And he gets sent home and there is the idea that maybe they had planned it because Flora in this version does say, Miles is coming home. Miles is coming home. You know, she knows he's coming before the letter even comes. So there's kind of the idea that maybe he did do something to get himself sent back to Bly, like in Bly Manor, which again, I really loved that episode where they show him at school and in the white pigeon and how that was whole interpreted. But here, you know, he's trying to come back home to his sister and he's met by this woman who he has no idea who she is. And she barely gives him a moment before she starts grilling him about what happened. And she is pretty much in his face from the moment he comes home. <laughs> she really, I mean, she doesn't take any time to form any sort of relationship with him at all. It's it's just she wants to get in his head and find out what's wrong with him so she can like fix him. She she's there offering help that he's not ready to accept quite yet, which is, you know, pretty terrifying, I think. And if you look at it from that point of view, and then especially when if he's already afraid of her, and she sends everybody away and it's just the two of them how terrifying that must be because that's when he really starts pushing back at her like he's he's kind of been playing with her up to that point but it's not until I think he realizes that like everybody's gone and it's just the two of them and he does say some horrible things but like one of the things is you know he tells her don't shout because it makes her look ugly and cruel <laughs> Which I was just like, wow. And then, of course, yeah, when he calls her, he calls her a hag, a dirty hussy. Um, just all sorts of language is flying out of this kid's mouth. And it's terrifying to watch. But at the same time, if if we're watching this and we're supposed to be reading it as he sees her as a threat, then I don't know. That's... Um, that that gives a, I think a really interesting reading. Plus, and I don't know if maybe I'm making too much of this, but in that scene, she is dressed like Miss Jessel. She's wearing the all black dress, and part of me wondered if if he was reacting to that too, whether or not he'd seen Jessel the ghost. Like even it, maybe that was just the way she she dressed. Um, but she's wearing all black at that point. And part of me wondered if that wasn't where some of that, that anger was coming from too. And that fear. That's really interesting. Cause when she is looking at Jessel after Mrs. Gross takes Flora away screaming, I was thinking they're mirror images of each other because they're both looking at each other in the same position, wearing like the same dress. And yeah, I can totally I can totally see that. Oh, one other thing I wanted to throw in there to show why he might be terrified of her is, yeah, Flora's been taken away and he doesn't know, he doesn't know what that means. Um, we know that Mrs. Gross doesn't believe it's ghosts. She thinks the, the uh, governess made her, quote, face a bad memory she should have forgotten like a dream. But Flora screaming what Mrs. Gross says is filth. So we can only imagine what kind of language Flora is using. Now, this could just be two kids repeating what they've heard, like you said, Lisa. But I think that also heightens his fear of her because he doesn't know. I got the impression that the movie, unlike other ad adaptations in the novella, that they did not have communication, him and Flora. So he doesn't know what's going on. He just knows she was screaming all night long. So, and then, then he's alone with her. So I, I wonder if that, I mean, that, that also has to be heightening his fear of what she's going to do to him. 
And he obviously doesn't want to talk about what he did at school because he's ashamed of it. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of emotion going in there. He doesn't even have to be possessed <laughs> um, to get angry at her. Right. Well, it, yeah, that, I mean, that's true. I, and I had I, that, oh man, the scene where she, she forces little Flora to look at Jessel by the lake and then Jessel just has the scream. I mean, uh, Flora has a screaming fit all night. That, that is a difficult scene to watch um, because either she's forcing her to like look at a ghost and terrifying the child or the child is terrified because her governess is, is gone mad, basically. <laughs> um, and, and is making her remember all this horrible stuff she doesn't want to remember. But but yeah, we should probably talk about the ending a little bit because I, I know um, we could keep talking about this forever. And I know we're not going to talk about the 1999 Masterpiece Theater ending but <laughs> this one is quite different um it ends in the statue garden uh, miles is terrified because of everything that we've talked about and peter quint is there whether peter quint is in miss giddens mind or he's there as a ghost like his presence is felt there one thing i always find very interesting is the shot where miles of course this is very different from the book um, from the i mean the the haunting of Bly Manor. And I, I'm very glad that Miles and Flora get a happy ending um, with their uncle. I'm I'm forever glad that <laughs> in Bly Manor we get that because in this one, the camera is looking down on the statue garden and we see Miles just terrified and in a panic and he falls to the ground. But in this one in particular... Uh, Miss Giddens it doesn't actually touch him when he falls. So I guess the implication is either the ghost got him or I don't know. He had some sort of like heart attack or like he got so frightened that he just fell down. Um, I don't know. What What is your take on the ending there? Well, there's that weird moment where you see Peter Quint's hand. And he like jerks his hand at the moment when Miles starts to fall down. I wondered if they were trying to imply that he did something to him. But if not, if it's not supernatural, like you were saying, then yeah, I assume they mean he had a heart attack. Um, because, I mean, she has put him through some pretty intense fear. And he's already broken from all the stuff that happened before. I mean, if this is... I don't know if I'm this kid and I've lost my parents and I've lost my father figure and my governess. It's obvious he's upset that the uncle doesn't pay any attention to them because he has that moment. Now his sister's gone. He doesn't know if she's going to die or what. He's alone with this woman who's like running after him and yelling at him. I feel like, I don't know. I feel like you could easily read it as he's just like shocked and dies because of that. One last thing that I think we should talk about before we let it go is the very end of the movie, the, the reason it got an X rating when it came out, because she kisses his dead body <laughs> on the lips. What are we to make of that? Is that the signature move of she caused all this and she has issues? Uh, she loves children. <laughs> <laughs> She says, oh, that would be the movie begins and ends with her saying, all I want to do is save the children, not hurt them more than anything. I love children. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what we make of that. <laughs> Except it's creepy and it, yeah, I, I can absolutely see why it would get an X rating. All right. Well, with that said, I think we've covered everything we set out to talk about. And like you said, Lisa, we could probably just keep on talking about this because we are total nerds when it comes to this kind of stuff. <laughs> but listeners, if you have not seen The Innocence and you went ahead and listened to us, go watch it. Let us let us know what you think. Let us know if you come down on a certain side about whether the kids are possessed or just naughty or traumatized or the governess has something to do with what's going on. Or maybe everybody has issues and they're, they're all being tormented by ghosts. But uh, if you have watched it before, let us know what you think too. We would love to hear from you. We're at NoFearCast on Twitter and Instagram. 
and we have a Facebook page. If you'd like to contact us by email, and we do love hearing from y'all, please send us an email at nofearcast at gmail.com. Let us know what you thought of Bly Manor now that we're finally done with it and Lisa can hear spoilers or let us know what you think of The Innocents. If you love what we're doing, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Uh, for $5 a month, you can become a Patreon supporter and get access to exclusive content. In between our main episode weeks, we have mini episodes where we talk about something we didn't get to or something related to the larger topic. Sometimes we give recommendations. Sometimes we hint to our supporters uh, what we'll be talking about next. But we totally understand with everything that's been going on in the country in the past year that you may not be able to uh, be a Patreon supporter. That's totally fine. Um, you may have, you know, with the economy the way it is, we totally understand there. You may have other places where you need to put your money right now. You could just simply rate and review us. That's entirely free. It helps with the all the um, podcatcher algorithms. So folks who are looking for podcasts like ours can find us. Of course, if you have a friend or family member that you think would like the show and aren't listening you could tell them as well. Thank you so much for listening as always. And we will be back in two weeks with a brand new episode.